Good morning and welcome. Please stand as you are able to embody your spirit and let us sing together. Come, Easterners. All hearts speak, and to whom no private thing is hid. Cleanse the intent of our hearts by your gracious gift, that we may love you completely and praise you wholly. Amen. Amen. God be with you. Let us pray. O oh God, you declare your almighty power chiefly in showing mercy and pity. 
Grant us the fullness of your grace that we, running to obtain your promises, may become partakers of your heavenly treasure through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. If therefore is any encouragement in Christ, any consolation from love, any sharing in the Spirit, any compassion and sympathy, make my joy complete and be of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourself. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bend, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed me, not only in my presence, but much more now in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who is at work in you, enabling you to both will and work for his good pleasure. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Let us pray responsibly, Psalm 78, breaking at the asterisk. Hear my teaching, O my people. I will open my mouth in a parable. That which we have heard and known, and what our forefathers have told us, we will, not hide from their we will recount to generations to come the praiseworthy deeds and the power of the Lord. And the wonderful works he has done. He worked marvels in the sight of their forefathers. He split open the sea and let them pass through. He made the waters stand up like walls. He led them with a cloud by day. And all night through the flow of fire. He split the hard rocks in the wilderness. And made them drink as from the river deep. He brought streams out of the cliff. And the waters gushed out.
The Holy Gospel of our Savior, Jesus Christ, according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Christ. When Jesus entered the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him as he was teaching and said, By what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority? Jesus said to them, I will also ask you one question. If you tell me the answer, then I will also tell you by what authority I do these things. Did the baptism of John come from heaven, or was it of human origin? And they argued with one another. If we say from heaven, he will say to us, why then did you not believe him? But if we say of human origin, we are afraid of the crowd, for all regard John as a prophet. So they answered Jesus, we do not know. And he said to them, neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. What do you think? A man had two sons. He went to the first and said, son, go to work in the vineyard today. He answered, I will not. But later he changed his mind and went. The father went to the second and said the same, and he answered, I go, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did the will of his father? They said, the first. Jesus said to them, truly I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are going into the kingdom of heaven ahead of you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him, and even after you saw it, you did not change your minds and believe him. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you. I speak to you in the name of the living God, blessed Trinity, and lover of your souls. Amen. You may be seated. Tell me without telling me. It's a phrase that went viral on social media in 2019, and it's still capturing attention today. Instagram and TikTok are bursting with videos aiming to master the art of show, don't tell. A tactic storytellers and preachers have been utilizing for very many years. For instance, a novelist could tell you exactly what a character is feeling. Margaret is angry. But a good novelist may write and said something like, Margaret slammed her mug onto the countertop with a thud, bronze liquid sloshed over its side, staining their kitchen table. You all right? Stephanie asked, wide-eyed. I'm fine, Margaret said through tight lips. Is Margaret fine, everybody? <laughs> no, she is furious. Today's gospel writer, Matthew, told us a story like this one just before today's text. Jesus entered the temple and cast out all who were selling and buying in it. He ruined the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. He told them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a hideout for robbers. Is Jesus fine, everybody? <laughs> no, he's furious. And Matthew told us without telling us. He showed us through the characters action. So, all this is to say you should check out the tell me without telling me hashtags. <laughs> You'll find a wide range of videos. I've been enjoying the ones titled, tell me you're a boy mom without telling me. The last one I saw shows a mom in full workout gear with 20 minutes free in her schedule to practice Pilates at home, but she can't do her workout routine because she can't find her green and yellow weights. So her video is a time lapse of her racing through the house, getting us wet with her workout gear on, looking for the dumbbells, only to find them at minute 21. They have become, they've become the foundation for her son's yellow and green Lego superhero fortress. <laughs> Tell me you're a boy mom without telling me. I've also enjoyed the hashtag, tell me you're from Ohio without telling me. Uh, I learned about a woman who has a tattoo of a cornfield on her left thigh, and there's a highway billboard above it that reads, hell is real. <laughs> tell me you're from Ohio without telling me. So Matthew is not the only one who's good at this showing but not telling stuff. Jesus is actually pretty good at it too. 
In fact, this is one of his signature moves with parables. And today's parable, it's not about a boy mom or a cornfield, but it is about a boy dad and a vineyard. Jesus tells this story right after he encounters some temple priests who question his authority. They come to him shortly after that turning over of tables episode. The priests seem unhappy with him, and he seems pretty unhappy with them. Who gave you this authority to teach the crowds, they ask Jesus outright. Now, we all know Jesus has no rabbinic college degrees or professors of earthly pedigree to boast, as these learned priests likely do. But he's not flustered by their question, and he steps right into that battle of wits with them. Who gave me authority to teach? Hmm. Well, let me ask you this, Jesus says. Who gave my cousin John the authority to baptize? And that question, ooh, it stumped those priests because it infers that Jesus' ministry may come from similar authority. If the priests want to discredit Jesus, then they'll have to discredit John the Baptist, whom the people already love and revere as a prophet. So they give no meaningful response, and while these priests are without words, Jesus utilizes the moment of silence to speak a parable. He says to them, the parable of the two sons, at least that's how our Bibles commonly title it, but I think it could be titled, Tell Me Without Telling Me. The parable goes something like this. There's a dad who has two kids. Dad says to the first kid, get off your video gaming chair and go do your work in the vineyard. And the kid says, no, I don't want to. I'm not going to go. So dad takes a deep meditative breath and walks away, not because he's given up, but probably because he needs to get out into the vineyard too, and so does second kid. So dad knocks on the door of teenager number two and says, wake up, kid, time to go to work. And that cherub child wipes tired eyes, smiles at dad, and says, okay. But as soon as the bedroom door closes, the kid rolls over, goes back to sleep. Dad leaves for work. The second son sleeps. And you know what that first son did, that antagonistic and defiant child? Well, he got up and went to work. So tell me, parents out there, did the first kid or the second kid please the parent? Kid number one, right? (laughs) That son whose words dripped sweet as honey did not please dad. The son who was stubborn as all get out. The resistant one, that's the kid that did what was expected of him. Parents, your parents don't care if uh, you say the things they want them to, you want, they want you to hear. What? I'm not saying that right. Your parents don't care if you say the things they want to hear. (laughs) Parents care whether you do the thing you're supposed to do, right? Jesus says God's the same way. And in so doing, in so sharing this parable, Jesus shows the priests that they came asking the wrong question. It doesn't matter who teaches someone what to say. What matters is doing what we're supposed to do. The religious leaders came to Jesus to argue, but the people, the crowds there, they came to Jesus to learn something. Those ones who struggle each day, the ones who are worrying, I'm not doing enough, they came to learn how to live as God wants them to live, to be the kind of people God wants them to be. Turns out, The crowds of defiant, rebellious sinners are better children of God than their priests. Actions not only speak louder than words. Stanford research and scholarship tells us that actions, those happen before our thoughts happen, too. For instance, if dad gives a dad joke, your eyes are going to roll before you can find the words to describe what you're thinking and feeling about it. (laughs) When someone asks you for directions, try sitting on your hands and explaining a complex route to them. Yes, I'm speaking directly to all you fellow Italians in the room. I know you can't do it. I know you can't. Research shows that if people are prevented from gesturing when they speak, they have a harder time finding words. 
And if people are prevented from gesturing when they study complex descriptions, they don't learn as well. Actions do more than help others understand us. They actually help us to think and to talk. How we act in the world around us literally shapes how we think. Action shapes thought. But far too often we think about it in the reverse. In the last 30 years or so, there's been an uptick in cognitive science research around embodiment. So we're thinking about how human beings think and recognizing that it's through more of the body than just the brain. We all know that if we want to understand what someone else really thinks, rather than asking them, we can probably get more information if we watch how they live, how they act, what they do. We know in our bones that actions speak louder than words. In Jesus' parable, child number one's thought was no, and he was happy to share it with dad. But his actions were yes, and his actions showed the father who that child really is, what that child believes, more than the words ever did. We can examine others' actions to know them better, and we can also reflect on our own actions to know ourselves better. Right? Why, why do you think one thing, but you do another? I do it all the time. You might tell yourself you believe something to be true, but if your actions aren't aligning with that belief, guess what? You probably don't believe it. That's what Jesus is trying to teach the priests and the crowds in this story. Priests and crowds, just like us here. We're all like the sons in Jesus' parable. Our actions and our inactions reveal who we are and what we think. I wonder what you might learn about yourself this week if, for some spiritual fun, you stopped assuming you know yourself and instead you began reflecting on what your actions say about who you are and what you believe. See what happens then if you change an action. Do your thoughts about yourself, about God, do your beliefs change with those actions? We can sometimes get so lost in our own heads, stuck in our thoughts. We can live here instead of out here. So what if we took those embodied cognitive scientists at Stanford seriously and Jesus too? Perhaps you might find that you're walking into the king of heaven before your priests are. <laughs> Jesus seems to say that it doesn't matter how many times you mess up trying, as long as you have come to Jesus looking to walk the path to the kingdom of heaven. You don't need to be a learned priest to do that. God says, telling me without telling me, that's just fine. No one needs to prove their authority to do the work God has given them to do. So rather than rack your brain for the right question to ask, try doing the right thing. Perhaps the answer to your question will turn out to be an action rather than a thought. Continue on page six as we affirm our faith together. We believe in God who creates all things, who embraces all things, who celebrates all things, who is present in every part of the fabric of creation. We believe in 
God as the source of all life, who baptizes this planet with living water. We believe in Jesus Christ, who suffers with the poor, the malnourished, and the refugees, who loves and cares for this world. And we believe in Jesus Christ, the seed of life, who came to reconcile and renew this world and everything in it. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the breath of God, who moves with God, and who moves among and with us today. We believe in everlasting life. For our deepest and most holy longings, we pray. For all who wander, who hunger, who thirst, renew us as people of service and compassion. For this planet, our home, renew our will to be healers of creation. For this and every nation, Renew in all people the will, the will for good, good and the longing for peace. For those whom we hold in our hearts, especially Sue, Laura, Paul, Karen, Tony, Deborah, Charlotte, Lori, Jim, Nancy, Stuart, Tim, Tanya, David, and Mary. We pray for loved ones who have recently died and for their families, especially Dwight C. Smith, Barbara Ann Roberts, and Bob Chidsley. We pray for U.S. military personnel and for their families. We pray for our companions in the Diocese of Belize and in the Diocese of Tonga, Tanzania. In the Diocesan Cycle of Prayer, we pray for St. John's Church, Cleveland, St. Luke's Church, Cleveland, and Trinity Cathedral, Cleveland. In the Anglican Cycle of Prayer, we pray for the churches in the Diocese of Ako Edo, Nigeria. We continue to pray for the health of our presiding bishop, Michael B. Curry. We pray for the volunteers who serve on the committees of the vestry, supporting the cathedral in all matters of finance, property, and personnel. We pray for our LGBTQ plus siblings in Christ in Cleveland, whose churches, schools, and workplaces limit the full expression of you who created of you who who you created them to be may your church O god honor the dignity of every human being we offer blessings upon those celebrating birthdays this week anna chapman stavros gazis andrew andrew harold taryn lee pam myers Anthony Piazza, and Nancy Ann Sinclair. Bless these and all creation with your goodness and renew our trust in your love. Amen. Accept the fervent prayers of your people, O oh God, in the multitude of your mercies. Look with compassion upon us and all who turn to you for help. For you are gracious, O oh lover of souls, and to you we give glory, blessed Trinity, now and forever. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. 
Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through the grace of Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. The peace of Christ be always with you, also with you. Peace be with you, Joy. Nancy Ann, peace be with you. Coming out, peace be with you. Morning, John. Good morning and welcome. Welcome to those of you joining us here in the cathedral. Welcome to those of you joining us online. We are so glad you're here. If you're joining us for the first time, you can learn about Trinity. You can pick up a... Um, at the base of the pillars, you'll find not only newcomer cards, but also information about Trinity. And you're welcome to be seated if you like. Um, but you don't, have, don't feel like you have to be. Um, if you're joining us online, you'll find a lot of that same information up at the very top. Uh, it is the beginning of October, which at Trinity Cathedral means we are beginning a great deal of our, of our program for the year, including Solemn Eucharist, which begins today, once a month at 5 p.m. here in the cathedral, as well as Evensong, which starts on Wednesday at 6. Join us for Choral Evensong. We are also beginning uh, fall programming that happens on Wednesday evening. That's something we have not done consistently since well before the pandemic. Uh, and I hope you'll take spend some time uh, on the website with our e-news exploring some of the many things that we're offering, including Becca Stevens doing a community forum in a week and a half, including classes on the Enneagram, uh, including classes on stained glass and architecture, lots that we're offering on Wednesday evenings this fall. So I invite you to check that out. Uh, next week is our celebration of the blessing of the animals, which we'll do as our abundant table service. Weather permitting, we will do that in the, in the garden out between Cathedral Hall and Mather Hall. Bring your four-legged, two-legged, or no-legged friends, uh, if you wish. That will be followed by a Sunday schmooze, a, a, an animal-themed Sunday schmooze. A great time to get to know people you don't know too well or introduce yourself to a dog or cat and find out what brought them to, them to, to Trinity Cathedral. So that's next Sunday. Uh, that also kicks off a week of support uh, again to end the death penalty in Ohio. If you'd like to compose a prayer for that, that will be read by Catherine Smite Zeitz on the, on the Capitol steps in Columbus in a little more than a week, send that to me uh, or to Adrian. And finally, be sure you, leave, you sp plan to spend time with us either Wednesday the 11th in the evening or Sunday the 15th when Becca Stevens of Thistle Farms is here preaching, and then she and a number of graduates of the program will be with us for the Sunday Forum. I'd like to invite Becky Fuller to come forward. As we announced last week, we have begun our, we might need that after all. Um, we, we have begun our annual stewardship campaign where we celebrate the ministry of Trinity, and we celebrate God's abundance with us. Becky is one of our two co-chairs of the team, along with Luke Taylor, and she's here to share a few reflections with us today. Thank you for the lectern. I was, I'd get a little worried if I was standing out without it. Um, we are again at the, that time of year when we focus on stewardship at Trinity, and it is a time when the church asks each of us to give to support the cathedral for the upcoming year. I'm honored to serve as co-chair this year. I am pleased to be here this morning to share with you. Stewardship is an important process for the cathedral, but I have found it to be a meaningful spiritual journey as well. It is a time we can think about how we use our time, our talent, and our financial resources. It is also a time we are asked to meditate on our relationships with God, the world around us, and with our possessions. When I knew back in July that I would be speaking today, I started rolling ideas around in my head. We happened to be on a family vacation with our kids and three grandsons, ages four, four and a half, and seven. 
It was a wonderful time, but more than once we heard, that's not fair. The adults started talking about what we thought they meant when they said, that's not fair. And our son made the observation, if they think fair is equal, then we will all need to give up a lot. This might sound a little familiar from last week's sermon when BJ preached on Jesus' parable of the workers in the vineyard. They all worked different amounts of time and were paid the same. And their response was the same as my grandson's. That's not fair. So with that beginning of thinking about what to say today, how does that fit with joyful giving in God's abundance? What is it that God is asking of us? It would be easy if God just deducted what we owe from our paycheck, and that would settle it. But that isn't how God works. So if it isn't equal, what is it? When I think of Jesus' love for each person, I think Jesus wants everyone to have enough. Not just enough money, a place to live, enough to eat, but enough love, enough friends, enough community, and enough meaning. If this is it, then there is a lifetime of sharing ahead for each of us. So with that as a backdrop, I want to talk about our stewardship theme this year, joyful giving, God's abundance. At Trinity, we have been blessed with so much. We have a beautiful building, a talented staff, a faithful congregation, and vibrant ministries that reach beyond our doors. There are so many ways to be involved. And I have found working with, I have found working with our neighborhood school, Mary and Sterling, to be very meaningful. There is Christian education for children and adults, music, work with racial reconciliation. You can grow vegetables in the community garden, work with students, serve meals at a place at the table, and support and have fun with each other as a community who follows Jesus. Just take a look at Trinity's website, which is a plug for the website, and you can see all the ways to be involved. Trinity is a place where new ideas and energy are welcome. And I know I found a home here. We have individually been given so much by God. And when we recognize all our life as a gift, how much grace has been extended to us, and how loved we are by God, we can open our hearts more fully to God and the world around us. When we see the gift of God's abundance, we are more aware that there is enough in life for everyone. Listening to and learning what God values through study, prayer, and fellowship with others wanting, also wanting to grow in their faith, this has all helped me to look beyond myself to see the need in the world. Recognizing God's abundance can give us an open heart to the world, and we will want to share freely and joyfully. At the beginning, I talked about this being a faith journey. And I know that having enough or more than enough does not necessarily make it easier to give. Sometimes it makes it harder to see God's hand in my life because I, I can feel quite self-sufficient. For me, it has, been a hard, it has been the hard times, not the easy times, that I have more clearly seen God's hand in my life. Being, jo being a joyful giver has also, also has its challenges for me. On one level, I can say that God has given me so much but on the other hand, there is a fear that I won't have enough. Giving doesn't always come easily for me and is where I want to grow in trusting that God will take care of me. So even though I don't do this consistently, when I recognize that what I have is a gift from God, I feel freer. There's a peace that comes from trusting God for everything. In Ephesians um, chapter 3, verse 20, Paul writes, Our God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all we ask and think. Abundance gives us an open heart to the world around us, and we want to share more freely. Let us join together on this journey of faith. Because of God's abundance, we are able to joyfully give. Thank you. Thank you, Becky. Is anyone celebrating a birthday or anniversary this Sunday? Who was listed in the bulletin? 
It's always an option. It's always an option. Nancy Ann, what day is your birthday? The sixth. The sixth. Pam, what day is your birthday? The second. God be with you. Let us pray. Oh God, our times are in your hand. Look with favor, we pray, on your servants, Nancy Ann and Pam, as they begin another year. Grant that they may grow in wisdom and grace and strengthen their trust in your goodness all the days of their lives, through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. And I invite you to walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and sacrifice to God. give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. We praise you and we bless you, holy and gracious God, source of life abundant. From before time you made ready the creation. Your spirit moved over the deep and brought all things into being. Sun, moon, and stars, earth, winds and waters and every living thing you made us in your image and taught us to walk in your ways but we rebelled against you and wandered far away 
And yet, as a mother cares for her children, you would not forget us. Time and again, you called us to live in the fullness of your love. And so, we join this day with saints and angels in the chorus of praise that rings through eternity, lifting our voices to magnify you as we sing. and honor and praise to you, holy and living God, to deliver us from the power of sin and death and to reveal the riches of your grace. You looked with favor upon Mary, your willing servant, that she might conceive and bear a son, Jesus, the holy child of God. Living among us, Jesus loved us. He broke bread with outcasts and sinners, healed the sick and proclaimed good news to the poor. He yearned to draw all the world to himself, and yet we were heedless of his call to walk in love. Then the time came for him to complete upon the cross the sacrifice of his life and to be glorified by you. On the night before he died for us, Jesus was at table with his friends. He took bread, gave thanks to you, broke it, and gave it to them and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. As supper was ending, Jesus took the cup of wine. Again, he gave thanks to you, gave it to them, and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you and for all for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Now gathered at your table, O God of all creation, and remembering Christ, crucified and risen, who was and is and is to come, we offer you our gifts of bread and wine, and ourselves a living sacrifice. Pour out your Spirit upon these gifts, that they may be the body and blood of Christ. Breathe your Spirit over the whole earth, and make us your new creation the body of Christ, given for the world you have made. In the fullness of time, bring us with all your saints from every tribe and language and people and nation to feast at the banquet prepared from the foundation of the world. Through Christ and with Christ and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, to you be honor, glory, and praise forever and ever. As Christ teaches us, we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. God of promise, you have prepared a banquet for us. Happy are those who are called to the supper of the Lamb. The gifts of God, 
for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ poured himself out for us. Christ, we are there, the same bind, the same love in one body. Let us pray. God of abundance, you have fed us with the bread of life and cup of salvation. You have united us with Christ and one another, and you have made us one with all your people in heaven and on earth. Now send us forth in the power of your Spirit that we may proclaim your redeeming love to the world and continue forever in the risen life of Christ our Savior. Amen. May the God who creates life, the Savior who loves life, and the Spirit who is the fire of life bless you and keep you this day and forevermore. Amen. Peace out.
Let us go forth into the world rejoicing in the power of the Spirit. Thank you. 